Hello everyone and welcome to our 21st uh, recorded lecture on signalized intersections. Uh, we have learned the main concepts of signalization and also we went through uh, determining the optimal cycle lengths, the minimum cycle lengths and green durations in the previous recorded videos. Today I want to go through a series of examples and also I will talk about finding the control delay. In the next video, uh, we will try to wrap up our discussions on signalization. Okay, from this slide, we are going to go to a series of examples uh, that is going to deal with everything that we have covered so far in this chapter. And what I would like for you to do is exactly what what is exactly like what we did in the class. So. Uh, I would like for you to pause the video for a few minutes, go through the example on your own, try to do everything, and then resume the video and take a look at the answers that uh, I'm showing you. So here we have an intersection of two two-way streets. Uh, you can see the volumes that are shown up here and the intersection configuration is shown here. So the question asks to use the cross product guideline to determine if protected left turn phases are needed for any approaches. So our focus is pretty much on these left turn movements and we want to find out if there is a need to use a protected phase for these left turns. So why don't you pause the video here and then resume in five minutes or so. So what I will be doing on this slide is to find the cross product for westbound left, eastbound left, northbound left and southbound left separately and we go through a couple of these uh, calculations in details and then you will see how we determine the cross product. So for westbound left, we know that left turn demand is 250 vehicles per hour. So this is our westbound left demand. So this westbound left is gonna have conflicts with eastbound through, which is 900 vehicles per hour per lane or 900 vehicles per hour and also with eastbound right which is 200 vehicles per hour so the total opposing volume is 900 plus 200 so if you want to find cross product it is 250 this is left turning volume into 900 plus 200 so the total number is 275,000 vehicles per hour hour well it's vehicles square per hours square so the number of opposing lanes you will see that here on eastbound I have one lane here and one lane here so the total number of opposing lanes is 2 275k is more than 90k as a result V must use a protected left turn phase. So let's do the same thing for eastbound left. So what is our eastbound left turn demand? That is 300 vehicles per hour. How about the opposing volume? It is 1000 Respond through plus 150, which is respond right. So the cross product is the multiplication of 300 into the summation of 1,150. So that's going to give you 345k. Number of opposing lanes is again 2. 
so 345k is greater than 90k and we need to use a protected left turn phase if this 90k is coming from two opposing lanes if i had one opposing lane this was gonna go down to 50k for one opposing lane if i had three opposing lane this would go up to 110k So for northbound left and southbound left, we don't need to use a left turn phase because their cross product is less than 50,000 and they only have one opposing lane. So I suggest you guys to find cross products for those two left turn movements and see and, and verify that they are less than 50,000 K. So what is the phase plan that we suggest to use? We suggest to use a leading protected left turn phase for eastbound and northbound left and then follow it with true right and then for southbound and northbound we just don't use a protected left turn so that is the phase plan that we are gonna use actually in the next example Example 7.3, it's the same intersection, same volumes and layout. So we need to find the sum of the flow ratios for the critical lane groups for the three phase timing plan that we determined in the previous example. So what we need to do here is to find the summation of flow rate uh, to saturation flow rates for the critical lane group so what we need to do is that for each phase we need to be able to find the critical phase and then for each of them we just find the the ratio and sum them up so how do we do that one of the inputs that we need to have is the saturation flow rate for each of the movements and this table that I'm showing you here is giving us the saturation flow rate so I would like for you guys to to pause here for another five minutes use these saturation flow rates and analysis flow rates that were given you given to you in the previous slide and find analysis to saturation flow rates for each lane group based on that find the critical lane group and find the summation of the ratios okay for phase one eastbound left and westbound left are going into phase one the v over s ratio for eastbound left v is 300 s is given as 1750 so the ratio is 0.171 for westbound left the volume is 250 again the saturation flow rate is 1750 so the ratio is 0.143 among these two movements in phase one which one is the critical the one that has the higher ratio so that's eastbound left we are gonna do the same thing for eastbound uh, for for phase two in phase two eastbound to right are going to go at the same time with westbound to right so for eastbound the summation of true and right volume is 1100 the saturation flow rate is given as 3400 so the ratio is going to be 1100 over 3400 or 0.324 for westbound to right the summation of true and right movements is 1150 and the saturation flow rate is 3400 so the ratio is 0.338 so that tells us that this movement is the critical one let's move on to phase three for southbound left the volume is 70 the saturation flow rate is given at 450 so we find the ratio as 0 0.156 for northbound left we find the 
the V or the flow rate is given as 90. The saturation flow rate is 475. The ratio is 0.189. So this one is higher than the previous one, but it may not be the highest yet. So for southbound to right, the summation of to right movement is 370. Saturation flow rate 1800. The ratio is 0.206. And for northbound to right, the summation of true and right volumes or flow rate is 390. Saturation flow rate is 1800. So that gives the ratio of 0.217. So that is the critical movements, uh, the critical movement in phase three. So the summation of this number plus this number plus this number is going to give you the answer to this example, as you will see in the next slide. So the summation of critical flow rates, we can call it Y sub C, is 0.171 plus 0.338 plus 0.217 or 0.726. The question did not ask about last time, but if we assume that we have a two seconds of start of last time, two seconds of clearance last time per phase. So we are gonna have four seconds of last time per phase. We have three phases. Our total last time is 12 seconds. So now that we have determined the phase sequence, the summation of flow rate ratios over all critical movements and the last time we are ready to find the minimum and optimal cycle lengths so the same example same demand or flow rate same um, intersection geometry and same phase sequence so uh, you need to give yourself another five minutes here to go through the example and then resume with the video First thing that I want to do is to find C min. So the equation is L into X sub C divided by X sub C minus the summation of V over S ratios over the critical lane groups. We already have everything. Now, one thing that we don't have is X sub C. So uh, the summation of V over S ratios is 0.726. L is 12 seconds. We are going to assume that our X sub C is 0.9. So if you go with those numbers and plug everything into the C min equation, you're going to get 12 into 0.9. Um, divided by 0.9 minus 0.726. So that is going to give you a cycle length of 62.1. What we often do is that we round the cycle length up to the nearest 5 seconds. So in this condition, our cycle length is going to be 65 seconds. How about C optimal? We have the equation that is 1.5 into L plus 5 divided by 1 minus the summation of V over S ratios for all critical lane groups. So L is 12 seconds. That summation is 0.726. If you put everything into the equation, you're going to get an, a, 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 an optimal cycle length of 83.9. And if we round it up, to the nearest five seconds, we are going to get 85 seconds of cycle lengths, of optimal cycle lengths. So we are going to continue with the series of examples. We have the same example. It wants us to determine the green time allocation, assuming that the cycle lengths that we have found is 65 seconds. The example is the same again you need to pause here for five to six minutes and then resume with the video so 
So if you remember, we assumed that our x sub c was 0.9 seconds. And based on that, we found a cycle length of 62 point something. Then we said that we need to round up the cycle length to 65 seconds. And the main reason for rounding it to the nearest, rounding it up to the nearest five seconds is that traffic controllers used to work with increments of five seconds, but now you can put anything there. So you can put 62 seconds, but still we are gonna go with the same uh, way of working with cycle length. So because we have rounded up the cycle lengths and V over S ratio is not changed, L is not changed, X sub C is gonna change in our problem. We have increased cycle a little bit. So our expectation is that X sub C is gonna change. Do you think that it's gonna go up or down? Just think about it. So this equation that I have here is the same equation that we have used to find semen It's the same equation that I have solved it for x sub c. And because the c that we have put in this, that we are going to put in this equation is not anymore c mean, I'm going to get rid of those means that I added there. So if we plug everything that we have here, we can find a, an updated value of x sub c and then based on that we will be allocating the greens so our updated x sub c value is going to be equal to 0.726 that's the summation of v over s ratios into 65 that's the updated cycle length over 65 minus l or 12. that is going to give you an x sub c of 0.89 you see that it just slightly decreased why slightly? Because we slightly changed the cycle length. And you see that it is going down because we increased the cycle length. So we are now a little bit more conservative. So G1, we can find it using the equation that I showed you before, V over S for lane group 1, the critical one into C over X sub C. The X sub C here is the updated one. So that's equal to 0.171 into 65 divided by 0.89 or 12.5 seconds. This is eastbound and westbound left turn movements green. For phase two, we do the same. You just need to use a different value for V over S, which is 0.338. That is gonna give you 24.7 seconds of Green for eastbound and westbound true and right movements and for the other phase that is northbound right through left and southbound right through left your V over S is different so it's 0.217 and you multiply it by C over X sub C that's going to give us 15.8 seconds of green so if you just add up those three numbers and add the last time you're supposed to get 65. So if you get 65.1 65 or 64.8, that's fine. It's rounding errors. But if rather than 65, you find 70, then there is a mistake somewhere. In the reminder of this chapter, we are going to focus on finding control delay and level of service um, in an in a signalized intersection and we will find those at three levels first we focus on how to find control delay on a lane group for example for uh, eastbound left we are going to find control delay uh, then we will find control delay on all lane groups in an approach and we aggregate them and based on that we'll find control delay for the approach then 
after finding the control delay for all approaches in an intersection we will uh, aggregate those and find control delay for the entire intersection and at each level we also find the level of service and at signalized intersections the level of service is found based on control delay and the term that you heard so much um, or so frequently uh, even on this first uh, slide is control delay so let's first see what is control delay control delay is the delay that we experience due to the presence of traffic control devices and a traffic control device here is traffic signals so if traffic signals were not there you would not have to reduce your speed uh, and experience that delay that's why it is called control delay now if you remember to what we went through in chapter 5 we talked about dd1 queuing so think about it dd1 queuing um, was the queuing discipline where the arrival was deterministic the departure was deterministic and we also had only one channel and if we just want to bring dd1 queuing concept to signalize intersections to determine control delay we are going to underestimate the actual delay and there are two main reasons the first reason is that dd1 queuing is going to assume that there is no acceleration or deceleration so what that mean what that means is that when a vehicle is going to stop the speed is going to change from approach speed to zero in an instant and when the signal turns green and a vehicle wants to speed up the speed is going to change from zero to free flow speed instantaneously so that's not realistic and as a result of that dd1 is going to underestimate the, the actual delay also dd1 is deterministic so what is the assumption there the arrival is deterministic the departure is deterministic that's not the case the arrival is not deterministic at an intersection and can go up and down now if the number of vehicles that are arriving is way less than the capacity of that lane group then that stochasticity is not a is not gonna cause a big problem because what if your capacity is 100 vehicles uh, per hour per lane group and the number of vehicles that are arriving is 10 so even if in one cycle you have 10 additional vehicles that are arriving nothing is gonna happen so we are gonna be fine there However, what is going to happen if the volume that you have there is closer to the capacity? So let's say still your capacity is 100 vehicles per hour per lane group. And now on average you get 85 vehicles per hour. Now if randomly in one of the cycles you get a few more vehicles that takes that total number to more than the capacity you're going to have a signal failure you're going to have additional control delay that is not accounted for by a dd1 model and if you think about it a dd1 model is going to assume that there is no signal failure unless volume is more than capacity but we know that's not the case even when volume is less than capacity you can have cycle failures because in one cycle you all of a sudden receive more vehicles than you can process so let's take a look at this equation the way we analyze control delay is that we divide it into 
three different components d1 d2 d3 so what is d1 d1 we call it uniform delay this is the delay based on the assumption that everything is uniform everything is dd1 so we know that we are underestimating and we have not accounted for that randomness so to account for that we are going to add d2 d2 is the component that is going to take into account the randomness in arrival so it's going to increase your control delay uh, and it's going to account for randomness and we have another term d3 so let's think about d3 what it has to do with delay we have already accounted for uh, delay that is due to uniform arrival and due to randomness but what is left out what is left out is initial queue presence at an intersection so what if there are some vehicles that couldn't be processed in the previ previous cycle and now they are tallied from that cycle to the next one and now you need to account for those d3 is here to account for those now in this course we go through how to find d1 how to find d2 but we are going to ignore d3 and we are going to always assume that there is no that there is no initial q and d3 is zero So let's take a look at control delay. Again, this is the delay that is caused um, as a result of uniform vehicle arrival. So you can see the equation here. I'm not gonna go into how to derive this equation, but C in here is uh, the cycle length. So either it's given to us or we have determined it for uh, the intersection. GI is the green time for the lane group that you are working on. So uh, lane group I is what we have here. Then you have one minus minimum of one and XI into GI over C. So XI is V over C ratio for lane group I and really how that minimum function works there is that you need to find xi you need to know what is the volume you need to know what is the capacity so you divide the volume by capacity you find xi and if xi is less than one that minimum function is going to give you the value of xi let's say xi is 0.8 okay so that minimum function is going to give you 0.8 so you have 1 minus 0.8 into GI over C. But if your volume is more than capacity, so let's say your XI ends up being 1.1, then the minimum of 1 and 1.1 is going to be 1, and you're going to use 1 in your calculations. So here is the equation for D2. This is a uh, random delay and its role is to account for the randomness that we have in, in the traffic flow. So T here is the duration of analysis period in hours. A lot of times we are analyzing an intersection for a period of study period of 15 minutes. So your T is going to be one fourth of an hour or 0.25 hour xi is identical to what you saw on the previous slide it's the v over c ratio for lane group uh, and then you have k i and small c so small c is the capacity of the lane group so it's not changed compared to what we saw in the previous slide K is delay adjustment factor and it's it depends on signal control mode uh, we will talk about that in the following slide and I is upstream filtering metering adjustment factor 
I will be talking about this one also on the next slides. Okay, so we discussed that if the study period is 15 minutes, the value of T that you need to use is going to be 0.25 hours. T is in hours. For the K factor that you observed on the previous slide, this factor deals with the control mode of the signal. So if you have a pre-timed control, you're going to use a value of 0.5. But if we have an actuated control, the value of K is going to be different. Um, our assumption is that an actuated control can improve the operations. So we expect that it's going to reduce um, the random delay. And as a result, the value of K could be less than 0.5. Now, the reason that we think it's going to reduce random delay is that an actuated control is responsive to the demand. So if the demand goes up, it can extend the green so that it can accommodate that demand and it's going to reduce the random delay. So we're going to assume a value of 0.5 in this course. We are going to assume that the signals are pre-timed. Now, the last factor that I want to talk about it is I. Uh, this is upstream filtering metering factor. So this factor adjusts for uh, the impacts that uh, you're going to see at an intersection due to presence, due to the presence of an intersection upstream of that intersection. And the way that we find I is that we find the variance of the number of arrivals, vehicle arrivals per cycle. And we divide it by the average number of arrivals per cycle. So it's the ratio of variance of arrivals to the mean or the average. So if it's too big, it means that the variance is much larger than the mean. If it's if they are the same, then I is going to be equal to 1. So for non-isolated intersections, if you have several intersections on an arterial street, the value of I is going to be less than 1. Um, and these intersections are going to help each other in reducing the variance. But if you have an isolated intersection, the value is going to be assumed to be equal to 1. So for the purpose of this course, because our focus is on isolated intersections, we always assume that I will be taking a value of 1. Now, the last thing is uh, initial Q delay or D3. As uh, I discussed earlier uh, in this lecture, it is the delay that we are going to experience because of the presence of initial Q at an intersection. Uh, we usually see this when the green is not enough to process all vehicles. So at the end of green, there are going to be some vehicles that while they were present there, they could not be processed and they're going to be waiting for the entire red duration. And then they hopefully will be, they, the intersection will be able to process them in the next green or next cycle. Now, how to deal with it? is going to be out of scope of um, our class. So we are not going to talk about it in this class, but in either advanced traffic control or traffic operations class, um, this topic will be covered.